Sweet. $3.50 split. This used to be the only yardstick for how well a company was doing. But today it's no longer enough for businesses just to do well. They are also expected to do good. More and more companies are getting more focused on social responsibility. Investors are increasingly concerned about the impact on the climate. People are feeling more confident about calling companies out for their lack of diversity. Helping to facilitate this shift is new technology. From greenhouse gas sensors to supply chain trackers. But what does this more cuddly form of capitalism mean for the bottom line? This would have once been unthinkable. This is the plane we're going to be using today. So this is a twin-engine Navajo, and uh, our camera is installed inside the cabin. An aerial survey commissioned by a fossil fuels company in order to reduce its carbon footprint. We're going to go do a flight uh, doing some methane monitoring. So we're going to be flying over some oil and gas sites, and uh, we'll be monitoring for, for emissions and leaks uh, from those facilities. It reflects a growing awareness of climate change within the corporate world, including the biggest polluters. We need energy operators who can produce the energy we need in a, in a responsible way. We want to enable them to have the information that they need to make that appropriate uh, decision. Using a special sensor, GHG-SAT can identify methane leaks, so the fossil fuel companies can plug them. As the sunlight hits the ground and the light comes up through the atmosphere, if there's methane there, our sensor will see an absorption of that sunlight signal. It's thought that methane causes about a quarter of man-made global warming. In the short term, it's a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. We need to address both. Let's be clear about that. But if you want a faster return on your investment, uh, really it's a great idea to target methane first. The incentive for the fossil fuel companies is to save money by losing less methane. But there are longer term financial incentives too. When we first started GHG SAT almost 10 years ago, everybody assumed we were doing this for regulatory reasons, that operators would be motivated by the fact that regulators will insist that they do this. That's not the driving factor today. It's because their customers want them to do it. It's because their investors want them to do it. It's because their own employees want them to do it. There's a whole generation coming into the workforce now that absolutely insists that their companies respect the environment and show that they're serious about tackling climate change. The other thing that we should just go over is how to load up a different block. So once you finish one line, it'll be having to open up the next one. As well as collecting data by plane, GHGSAT also uses satellites to pinpoint emissions. We can see emissions from individual facilities anywhere in the world. We take that data and we convert it into useful information that companies and governments and analysts can use to better understand the emissions and ultimately control them and reduce them. They've also created a publicly available emissions map. It's access to data like this that is helping to inform a generation of more conscious customers who balance their desire to shop with a wish for a cleaner planet. Recent research found that 81% of consumers feel strongly that companies should help improve the environment, with younger age groups the most likely to believe it's important. Mary K. Bush has seen firsthand the rise of this more demanding demographic. Over more than four decades working in business and finance, she served three American presidents and sat on numerous corporate boards. If a company is harming the environment in which they operate, they are potentially harming the health of their own employees, of people in the community, people who could be their customers. Can you do that over a long period of time and continue to have those people as customers have a brand that is hopefully liked by those customers? Companies are remarkably wasteful. 
it's good for their bottom line if they operate more efficiently. But even companies that are not directly seen as big emitters, the tech companies in Silicon Valley, for them too, there's very much a marketing benefit that comes from embracing climate-friendly factors as well. Ultimately, the most important thing is that the planet needs them to do it. It's part of a growing trend in business to talk of values beyond merely making money. A marked shift from the 70s and 80s when the shareholder was king. Profits were the priority and greed was good. But the world became more globalised and the pressure on companies to be more socially responsible grew. Then came the financial crisis in 2008 and faith in governments declined. Instead, the public began to turn to companies to fix society's most pressing problems. A recent global survey found that more than two-thirds of people believed CEOs should step in when governments fail to fix societal problems. Businesses' primary responsibility is to their shareholders. They own the company. But there is a lot of pressure being placed on big companies that wield so much power in the community, in the country, in the world. People have almost begun to look at them like quasi-governments. Balancing the demands of society with those of shareholders requires innovation. So what does this mean for the bottom line? Take an issue highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, how companies treat their employees. At the height of the pandemic, factories such as this polymer manufacturer in Karachi were faced with a simple choice, keep their employees safe or shut down. COVID was a new phenomena to make people come out of their homes and work at a plant site where there are multiple people. They were confused whether they will be affected or not and what kind of measures we are taking as employers. Fearing a loss in production, the factory turned to technology to create a safe working environment, using AI to track whether employees are complying with COVID rules. The tech is designed by British company Empiricai. Using CCTV feeds, it calculates whether workers are socially distancing and wearing face masks correctly. This red line is showing the violation of social distancing is at this location. Vast number of observations are higher in the INE technician's office. Hmm. So we will report it to the building owner and see what measures we can take to reduce these. Had we not had this software, we would not have operated our plant with so much comfort and with sustainable runs. When we showed people analytics, reassured them that they are complying with the requirements and there is no exposure to them from their co-workers. The pandemic brought out the importance of employee welfare from day one. From a health point of view, immediately, it was absolutely vital for companies to look after their employees, not just for the employee's benefit per se, but the reputational risks of having an explosion of COVID in your factory was huge. But the use of this tech is not always benevolent. Some companies have been overzealous in tracking the movements and behavior of remote workers and employees. Sometimes these days, it's almost as if companies know more about their employees than the employees' families do. Not just when they clock in and when they clock out, but when they go to the bathroom. It can be very dispiriting for employees. Certainly there are concerns about privacy aspects of this too. A recent survey of British employees found that almost three quarters of those surveyed felt that workplace surveillance would damage trust and unhappy workers are bad for business. It's really important to have happy workers in order to have workers who are prepared to chip in their thoughts and their ideas, and, and that's really what business is all about. 
The productivity of a company can also be affected by the diversity of its workforce. The Black Lives Matter protests in 2020 pushed racial injustice and lack of diversity in workplaces up the corporate agenda. I have been mistaken for a defendant on numerous occasions. Black people are hugely overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Alexandra Wilson is a British criminal and family law barrister who has first-hand experience of these problems. I think even now I can count on one hand, probably without my thumb, the amount of times that I've seen a black judge. But yet, yeah, I could, you know, I could count numerous black defendants day in, day out. Alongside her day job, Alexandra campaigns for greater diversity in the workplace and argues more diversity means better business. I think that if you've got a diverse pool of talent, and that doesn't have to be racial diversity only, you know, that, that, that's gender diversity, that's looking at sexual orientation. Your company can think about things in more innovative ways. That goes for every sector, from the legal sector that I'm in to the creative sectors. Alexandra's career was kick-started with the help of diversity recruitment company, Rare. Its founder, Rafael Mercades, believes there are huge benefits to be gained from hiring employees like Alexandra from socially diverse and deprived backgrounds. The issue has always been, is it a correlation or is it a causality? I.e., does a diversity drive the performance? Or perhaps is it that high performing organisations can afford to spend money on diversity? I think you can say, reasonably, it's becoming apparent that individual high performers are disproportionately likely to be people from lower achieving schools who've got very good grades. Those gritty, resilient outperformers tend to continue to outperform. Rare has designed an algorithm that helps companies to identify candidates with high potential from underrepresented backgrounds. It creates a level playing field by comparing candidates' exam results at 18 against the average of other students at their school. A student with three A's might seem more impressive than a student from another school with an A and two B's. But if the average result at the first student's school was three A's and the second was three D's, then the second student becomes a more impressive choice. The algorithm combines this with other information, such as whether they received free school meals or whether they were a refugee, and generates a number which can be used by employers to better compare candidates. I want to look at people from schools in the bottom 40%. I want them to have outperformed their average by at least 40%. There's one here at Leicester, one at Brunel. These are very much the sorts of people that you might miss in a traditional campus recruitment round. So if we look at this candidate from City, for example, looks remarkable. You're talking about four contextual flags, an outperformance of 40%. So she looks great and she'll make some of them, hopefully, a, a lot of money. That level playing field is hugely important. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama uh, in the 50s and 60s. Blacks in high-level corporate jobs was basically unheard of. When you think about extra energy that you've got to exert, when you can't just walk through the door, but you've got to pry open the door, <laughs> then that's productive energy that could be used for some company and creating new products or expanding to new markets. Research by McKinsey found that the most ethnically diverse management teams were a third more likely to outperform the least diverse teams when it comes to profits. Ultimately, there is going to come a time, if that time hasn't come already, where clients are going to look to companies and expect that those companies are representative. People are feeling more confident about calling companies out for their lack of diversity. I look at companies and I think, if I can't see representation there, I'd rather put my money where I can see representation. 60% of American consumers said a brand's reaction to the Black Lives Matter protests would influence whether they'd buy from or boycott them in the future. Some companies have incorporated diversity into their marketing. In 2016, Colin Kaepernick, an NFL quarterback, took the knee during the US national anthem. Out of that protest by Colin Kaepernick. You can see Kaepernick kneeling on the anthem. sideline. His action inspired hundreds of other sports stars to do the same. Two years later, Nike made Kaepernick the face of its advertising campaign. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. 
ask if they're crazy enough. They took a calculated decision that this was a principled stance for one thing, but also a stance that was going to appeal to their consumers as well. The difficulty that companies face is that if they take a political decision, they may well alienate some of their consumers. Politics, <laughs> that's always a tough subject. People in this country certainly are free to exercise their vote and exercise their voice, but is it proper to do that within the company? There are some issues that are sometimes so egregious that people have to speak up, but people also have to learn what's the line too far. And I think we are feeling our way and people are learning. For companies, this delicate balance between doing good and doing what's best for the bottom line is also apparent in the growing scrutiny of supply chains, in particular, products that come from China. Companies are on the horns of a very tricky dilemma at the moment. On the one hand, they are under pressure to be much more picky about the goods that they use and how they are produced. On the other hand, they sell into China and produce in China, and if they could, they would have nothing to do with internal politics in China because they know what a dangerous game it is. In 2020, companies that use cotton grown in the Xinjiang region of China came under the spotlight. Hundreds of thousands of people from ethnic minorities are being forced to pick cotton. Home to the Uyghur community, there was concern that forced labor had been used in the production of the cotton. Firms rushed to reassure their Western customers that they didn't source cotton from Xinjiang. But in retaliation, China threatened to ban the brands. This is what happens when your brand ignites the wrath of the world's biggest fashion market. The tricky thing is that cotton is very hard to trace. But one company may have a way to ensure that ethical standards are being maintained in supply chains. Applied DNA Sciences has developed a way of tagging cotton fibers with DNA molecules. For cotton, which doesn't normally have its own identity, we use DNA tagging to establish identity. When we create a unique molecular tag, that tag designates the date, the time, the place, the location, even the social and ethical practices that are adopted at that particular location for that precise type of cotton. The tagging usually happens once the cotton has been picked. It's sent to a cotton gin to be cleaned and then sprayed with a fine mist of the DNA molecular tag. That tag can't be tampered with and certainly it cannot be copied. By tagging it, we can ensure that that cotton stays that way from the fiber to the yarn to the fabric all the way to the finished product. So show me the sample um, that corresponds to the cotton that we tagged. Being able to trace the cotton in their products helps companies avoid costly lawsuits, as well as ensure they are getting the quality of cotton that they paid for. And it can be used as a marketing tool. So the Pima we grow is the Pima you get. The brands and manufacturers we're working with have decided that this is a great way to be able to show the consumer they are being proactive. Integrity of supply chain is directly related to trust. And when companies make claims that are not true, that they're really one click away from damaging their whole brand. Money, money. From ethical supply chains to diversity, employee welfare to the environment, the pressures on companies to be more socially responsible are increasingly influencing where investors put their money. money. But how do you work out which companies are actually doing good? Enter ESG. 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 Environmental, social and governance. ESG is, in a sense, a way of measuring for companies 
things apart from the bottom line. It looks at their impact on the environment. It looks at their impact in terms of the people that they hire, the impact in terms of the way the company is run. In a sense, it creates a more holistic view of the company than just the dollars and cents that it, it spits out at the end of every quarter. For businesses, scoring highly on ESG metrics is becoming increasingly crucial. In the past decade, there's been a nearly four-fold increase of sustainable funds available to American investors. But there aren't standardized criteria for measuring ESG compliance, so it can be hard to choose. RepRisk, a Zurich-based analytics company, has one solution for the new breed of ethical investor. We're essentially looking at what the world is saying about a company rather than what the company itself is reporting about its activities. Instead of just looking at what they're disclosing, which sometimes may be intransparent or biased or may mask risks, we're looking at a way that serves as a reality check. We tell our clients, how in fact is this company managing human rights, managing climate change, or any other ESG issue around the world where they operate? So if you look at this now. Yeah. Oh, wow. OK, so we're really talking. RepRisk has developed AI to scour over 100,000 different sources from around the world, from news reports, think tanks, and even social media. If a risk is identified, a human analyst takes over, looking at its severity, how new it is, and where the source comes from. A lot of these factories that have been sampled by the NGO, they supply garments to a lot of well-known fashion brands. The data from RepRisk is used by banks, insurance companies, and asset managers to work out where to invest their money. I think today it's well accepted that ESG has gone mainstream, that it's no longer a nice to have, but a must have. The way that a company manages ESG issues can be seen as how future-proof they are in an ever-changing world. The question is whether a company that focuses a lot on its social responsibility does actually produce better returns over the long term. The chances are that we will see a correlation emerging there. It's been somewhat obscured lately by the fact that some of the companies that perform best on ESG scores, like the tech companies, have had the most fantastic stock market run-ups. While we live in a world in which there is not a lot of trust in governments, there's pressure on anyone in society to deliver better social outcomes. Right now, CEOs are really in the frame there. There is a risk to this. If a CEO's mission reflects what the wider public wants, but not what the shareholders want, they could find themselves in hot water. The CEO of Danone, a French company, was a strong supporter of sustainability. But in 2021, he was ousted by shareholders because of Danone's languishing share price. The danger inherent in all of this is that CEOs can easily fall into grandstanding. This burnishes their status in society if they stand up and sound like they're acting as saviors of the world. And that can cause quite a dissonance that shareholders get very uncomfortable with. But as the average age of shareholders falls, their priorities might change too. The average age of a first-time investor has fallen from 45 in 2012 to 37 in 2021, which means the pressures on businesses to do good are unlikely to go away. Companies really take a big risk in not listening to what that demographic is thinking and saying and doing. I think we're on a path that businesses are going to see they have to get innovative in order to be responsive to that and still serve their shareholders. Give them that new product play, more style, better quality, new features, and at the right price. I don't think this is a short-term thing. I'm Henry Trix, business columnist at The Economist. To keep up to date on ESG and the changing demands on business, please click on the link opposite. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and thanks very much for watching.